Jesus Christ is head of the church. Always has been, always will be. And if I don't like what is happening, well, Jesus is patient. And we see that in history, 150 years in Indiana, Christ is patient. But we see the evidence of his work and we'll continue to see that here today. And so as you go from here into your churches, just remember the Jesus that worked with the pioneers in Indiana is the same Jesus that's working in your church. And he is the head of your church. Your pastor is not, you are not, the elder is not. Jesus is the head of the church. And if he's patient, and he is not getting in and changing things radically, eh, you can be patient. And I told some pastor the other day and some church members, you know what? If God wanted to, he could make President Xi, President Putin, President Biden, former President Trump, all have a heart attack the same week. <laughs> True. And if Christ wanted to make the change in your church or in the church, Adventist church worldwide, he can make that change instantly. But he is patient, so look to him. And the stories we hear today and, and the data we get today is affirmation of Jesus working in Indiana. So let's pray and we'll hear some more. Lord God, I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ is head of this church. And today, as we continue to see how he has been leading, I pray and ask that you give us confidence and hope that you will finish the work and that one day we will see you face to face and we ask that they, that they may come soon. So be very present with us and speak to our hearts and to our minds. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Doctor, come here. Once again, I want to be sure that uh, if there's anyone here that has not received the tour brochure or the questionnaire form, if you'd raise your hand and uh, the good Pastor Thorbertson will get that out to you. We want everyone to be on the same page and uh, enjoy, enjoy what we have to, uh, to share here. So, all right. Well, how many members of the Evansville and Muncie churches do we have here today? All right, all right. You came. You came. You want to hear the truth. <laughs> Very good. Very good. I talked to the conference president about it. I said, shall I tell him? He said, yes. We can learn lessons from our successes and our failures. So let them know. All right. Although the Panic of 1893, which was a national depression, may have curtailed some aspects of the Adventist work in Indiana, evangelism did not appear to be one of them. Instead, a small army of evangelists fanned out across the state to hold meetings under canvas, in rented halls, and in local churches. Now, one of the primary differences between the 1880s and the 1890s was that the evangelistic series in the 1890s often lasted four to six weeks, not just a few days. In mid-December of 1889, Frank Starr gave a lecture on religious liberty and Sunday blue laws at the Christian Connection Church in Daleville. A few weeks later, in February of 1890, Elder Rees had good attendance at his meetings in Landisville, Michaelsville, and Bogstown, despite incessant rain. In the fall of 1890, in Frankfurt, following six weeks of meetings, 11 signed the covenant, two agreed to keep the Sabbath, four were baptized, and a Sabbath school with 20 members was organized. Elders Huffman and W.A. Young entered Dana that summer where 1,000 people, including some of the best people in town, he said, came out to hear them speak. After preaching for seven weeks, the men organized a daily afternoon Bible study class. Finally, the ministerial brothers, Victor and Lucerne Thompson, teamed up for tent meetings in Lebanon, where despite heavy winds and rain that June, and competition from a Methodist camp meeting. Their attendance increased every night, a stark contrast to earlier Adventist tent meetings in Lebanon in 1877, which had reaped few results. 
Wind and rain, of course, took their toll on canvas tents, which quickly wore out. Consequently, in May of 1891, the conference pleaded that the Indiana Tent Fund needed money now to provide two new tents for the upcoming season when nine evangelists would take six tents out into the field. The first one, Victor Thompson, preached in Marion that spring, baptizing two converts, including a Quaker. The Quakers don't convert very easily in the 19th century. Weeks later, he headed north to Napanee, a village of 1,500 inhabitants, where the local residents packed his tent every night for three weeks, largely due, no doubt, to the fact that he used a small hand-operated printing press to produce some handbills to advertise his meetings. Our bills, though homemade, he declared, are neat and presentable. Soon, four Mennonites were keeping the Sabbath, while well, others agreed to do so after they had gained the victory over tobacco. J.M. Rees and Dr. William Hill held meetings together that summer in the Methodist Protestant Church in Jonesboro by special invitation from its pastor. And then they pitched their tent on Main Street in Richmond a few weeks later. During their five weeks in town, they sent weekly ads to the local newspaper and they distributed handbills to every house in town. Three of the attendees, of the 40 attendees, accepted the Sabbath. In the fall of 1891, J.H. McKinsey, who was a blind Adventist gentleman, gave a series of meetings at the Kokomo Church on West Taylor Street that packed the chapel. In Indianapolis and in Hughville that summer, William Covert and A.W. Bartlett, I think I'm running a little ahead, there's the William Covert slide, and Arthur Bartlett packed their 40-foot tent with up to 200 listeners during their 10 discourses. Our location is quite pleasant, they wrote, and love and harmony make our efforts sweet. When David Oberholzer and W.A. Young pitched their tent at Greenfield and Montclair in August, they rejoiced to see a good attendance during the local wheat harvest and four souls converted. There seems to be a growing inquiry almost everywhere to hear the truth, they declared. H.M. Stewart and J.M. Ellis encountered the same friendly kind of people at West Point that fall when over 75 citizens filled their 40-foot tent. One of them even provided a pump organ and others helped with the singing. When the series ended six weeks later, 16 were keeping the Sabbath and attending a weekly Bible class. What was markedly different about Adventist evangelism in the 1890s was that many of the Adventist preachers here in Indiana had accepted the 1888 Righteousness by Faith message. And their sermons began to reflect that. When M.M. M. Kenny preached to 175 citizens in Dover Hill in the winter of 1892, he declared in the review, I find it much easier to present the claims of the law by holding up my Savior. Thus, when a Mormon challenged Kenny and H.M. Stewart to a series of debates at Knox that summer, the two men refused to be drawn into the contest. Now that's perhaps the first time that a Hoosier Adventist preacher turned down the chance to win a debate. The two men won 18 converts by holding children's meetings instead and daily Bible readings. As the temperatures dropped that fall, they set up a wood-burning stove in their tent at El Nora, where many purchased Adventist books and tracts. Equally non-controversial, Elder Bartlett was enjoying so much success down in Indianapolis that the news decided to print the history of the rise of Adventism free of charge. You got it in the newspaper. But perhaps the most outstanding series of that summer occurred down in Terre Haute, 
where Rees and Young set up their tent on the corner of 8th Street and 3rd Avenue in June. Although they got off to a rather bad start when the newspapers mistakenly advertised them as Jehovah's Witnesses. And some hoodlums, that's their word, mainly students from Coates College, Rose Polytechnic, and the State Normal School, threw stones at their tent. Once that printed error was corrected, 125 citizens from Terre Haute packed their 40-foot by 60-foot tent. Soon many were keeping the Sabbath, and nine signed the covenant. Later in August, the men shifted the tent north to North 9th Street, and 19 more souls accepted the truth. Incredibly, Victor Thompson and J.M. Ellis, their preaching in Farmersburg and Portland, persuaded a Methodist pastor and a Roman Catholic evangelist to accept the Adventist message before they took their tent to Auburn for another four-week series. Meanwhile, over in Salem, then a village of about 2,000 inhabitants, J.M. Ellis and S.G. Huntington not only had a full tent every night, but many people were bringing them food as well. Wonderful hospitality the Hoosiers have. We see reasons for encouragement on every hand, President Starr exclaimed. Let the waiting people of God press on in the good work, for soon the conflict will be over. Shorter series in the spring of 1893 included H.M. Stewart and P.G. Stanley's two weeks in the Priam Schoolhouse. J.M. Rees' meetings in Marion prior to leaving for Arkansas and O.S. Hadley's 10-day series in the Harmony Hill Schoolhouse near Noblesville. But over in Terre Haute that summer, David Oberholzer, S.G. Huntington, and O.S. Hadley aroused a tremendous amount of interest in their topics by spreading 10,000 religious liberty tracts all over the city in just two days. After six weeks of preaching to a full tent, they baptized eight converts, voted three more into church fellowship, and established a Sabbath school with 30 members. In fact, one labor union leader in Terre Haute was so impressed with their preaching that he asked them to deliver their time of trouble discourse at a mass meeting of union members. Probably the only time that an Adventist minister attended a union meeting and preached. At no time in the past, Oberholzer wrote, has the interest been so good as at the present. When the weather turned bad that fall, the team moved their meetings into the handsome and commodious new church building in which 19 new converts joined the previous 30. So Terre Haute was up to 49 in its Adventist membership, many of whom had taken Bible studies from Cora Glunt and Teresa Thompson, the two female Bible workers in that area. Victor Thompson and Arthur Bartlett, with their tent master, W.H. Anderson, closed out the season in Indianapolis that fall, where their 23 converts swelled the city's Adventist congregation to 118 members. That was the largest church in Indiana at the time. And one of their members was an engineer for the Big Four Railroad, and he gave up his engine to obey God. But he was so valued by the railroad that they gave him a job as a switch engineer instead so he could keep his Sabbath and have a job. As the 1894 summer season neared, the conference decided to send six tent companies into the field. Each team would consist of three men. Now, typically two did the preaching and one, called a tent master, set up the tent and handled all the furnishings. We will go forward, President Starr exclaimed. John W. Young held two series of tent meetings in Fort Wayne, the first on Lewis Street, the second on the corner of Calhoun Street and Crichton Avenue. Well, Teresa Thompson and Louise Swartz gave Bible readings and led a small Sabbath school 
that had been organized in 1893 there. The tiny company met in members' homes and then in a rented hall for three years. Meanwhile, over in Noblesville, John Covert preached in a Baptist church, convincing many to give up their tea and their coffee. And then he traveled to Olivet Chapel, where after three weeks of meetings, 14 more joined the church, eight of whom insisted on being baptized immediately. And this is March the 4th. I rather imagine the water was close to freezing. His converts in Noblesville, however, were not as hardy. They deferred their immersion until some future time. After giving several discourses in Farmersburg and Newmarket, where the Methodist Episcopal Church was closed to him after two meetings, David Oberholzer returned to Terre Haute, whose citizens welcomed him with open arms. For six straight weeks that summer, his tent was packed to the edges every night. Eight converts were baptized and three more were added by vote, making nearly 30 new believers in the city over the last three months. During the 1895 season, J.W. Watt announced that instead of sending so many tents into the field, the tents were really getting ragged, they were wearing out, evangelists would now hold meetings in rented halls, local churches, and schoolhouses. Therefore, only four tents would be pitched that summer. Optimistically, Watt added, a few more tent and camp meeting seasons and the message will be finished. And then our Lord will come to take us to our Father's house, the mansions of the blessed. Hasten on, most glorious day. Watt himself began a season with a series of lectures in the schoolhouses at Etna Green, Knox and Rochester that spring. And elders J.M. Ellis and Schrock held a tent effort on the corner of 13th and Morton Streets in Lafayette that summer. As a result, 10 united with the church at Etna Green, 10 signed the covenant at Lafayette. In November of 1896, Watt organized a church of 20 members in Lafayette who met in the old German school at number 10 North 9th Street and in 1899 at number 211 North 9th Street. Mrs. Fred Johnston, who enrolled in the Lafayette Sabbath School that year, 1899, would faithfully attend every week of her life for the next 53 years. She also taught the kindergarten Sabbath School for more than 30 years. Quite a record. Meanwhile, when S.S. Davis, H.M. Kenny, and W.A. Ebert held tent meetings in Anderson, Don Juan, and Lyons that summer. Ten signed the covenant at Don Juan, five accepted the Sabbath at Lyons. Finally, O.S. Hadley and his wife, and this was the conference's only husband-wife evangelistic team at that time, held meetings in the courthouse at Logansport that fall, which they followed up with Bible readings and home visits. After six weeks, nine signed the covenant and 25 others continued attending meetings in a public hall. It appears from the Review and Herald that only three evangelistic teams hit the dusty trail in 1896, although I think it's likely that some others did and their reports came to the Indiana Reporter rather than to the Advent Review. J.W. Watt, J.M. Ellis, and H.M. Stewart faced stiff opposition from local ministers at Lyons, Elnora, Carlisle, and Pleasantville in January. After winning several discussions, they refused to call them debates now, they declared the work in this state is onward. Meanwhile, over in Logansport, O.S. Hadley faced similar opposition from local ministers until a black woman whose husband was a government employee invited Elder Hadley to her home to present the Sabbath truth to her husband, her pastor, and several of her Christian friends. When he had finished talking, this woman stood up and appealed to all of them to examine their Bibles regarding the seventh day Sabbath. To the surprise of everybody, her pastor then stood up 
and declared, the seventh day is the Sabbath. And I am ready and willing to accept this new light. Three of his parishioners also accepted the Sabbath truth. A few weeks later, F.M. Roberts delivered several lectures in the Dunkard Church on the corner of 22nd and Pearl Street in Marion, after which two Dunkards joined the Adventist Church. Following his meetings to a packed hall in Michelville, seven individuals began keeping the Sabbath in 1897. Another method of reaching the public appeared in the spring of 1898 when Adventists in Evansville opened the first downtown inner city mission with a team of dedicated workers. Soon their efforts paid off in the conversion of several local citizens in Evansville. Later that summer, uh, Sidney Davis baptized 16 converts following his tent meetings in Elwood. Returning to Evansville, he baptized nine more converts there, and one of them was a prominent Baptist pastor in town. Ironically, that pastor had recently baptized 28 of his own converts in the baptistry of his Baptist church. And now he himself accepted baptism into the Adventist church in his own baptistry. In the summer of 1899, I.G. Bigelow's tent meetings in South Bend led to the creation of a Sabbath school there. Its 11 members met in a rented upstairs hall at 911 South Michigan Street. Well, as you might expect, the phenomenal success of dozens of Adventist evangelists converting hundreds of citizens to Adventism during the 1890s quickly engendered some opposition in a number of quarters. Yet, Unlike in the 1880s, the disciples of Christ in the 1890s, perhaps realizing they were fighting a losing battle, quickly abandoned the field. In only four instances have I found any challenges to Adventist ministers put up by disciples of Christ in the 1890s. That was totally unlike them in the 1880s. When a Disciples of Christ pastor in Dana requested that Elder M.G. Huffman and W.A. Young enter into a public contest over the Sabbath doctrine with him in the summer of 1890, both of these young men that represent the new generation of Adventist Hoosier ministers positively refused. Here's what they said. It is not a Christian spirit to be always wanting to debate. In fact, they added, St. Paul condemned it as a malicious sin. Likewise, when another Disciples of Christ minister in Landisville challenged J.M. Rees to a debate in April of 1891, he too refused. But when this minister delivered lectures against the Seventh-day Sabbath and the State of the Dead, Elder Rees did take some time to review those lectures in his tent. And as a result, three of his listeners accepted the truth. Four years later, when F.M. Roberts and W.A. Ebert arrived in Etna Green with their tent in June of 1895, the Disciples of Christ hired a Mr. Updike to oppose them. But his course was such as to shake the confidence of many in his own cause, they added. As a result, the men baptized two converts and added ten more to the church rolls. The last recorded contest that I have found between a Disciples of Christ debater and Adventist ministers occurred at Lyons, January of 1896. And Elder W.R. Williams crossed swords with J.W. Watt, J.M. Ellis, and H.M. Stewart over the Sabbath, the role of the Holy Spirit, baptism by immersion, and the nature of the kingdom of heaven. Although both sides had agreed upon eight-hour sessions daily over an eight-day period, Elder Williams became conveniently ill after the second day and called off the rest of the debates. When his colleague, Elder McCarmichael, took his place, the contest was moved over to Elnora, where Elder Ellis responded to McCarmichael's charges. As a result, four listeners joined the Adventist Church. 
Two others were baptized, and three more began keeping the Sabbath. Far more often, at least until 1896, it was the local Methodist, Episcopal, Baptist, and United Brethren pastors now who opposed Adventist preaching. Sometimes their hostility took the form of holding simultaneous revival meetings, <laughs> as at Kokomo, Dover, and Frankfurt in 1890. At other times, it erupted into print, as in the fall of 1890, when Presbyterian pastor A.M. Hook had 6,000 copies of his sermon against the Seventh-day Sabbath distributed around Toronto. On still other occasions, local churches organized festivals, carnivals, parades, fairs, or shows to compete with Adventist meetings as they did in Maxwell, 1891, and Auburn in 1892. The most common form of opposition, however, was simply the refusal of local ministers to allow Adventist ministers to hold meetings in their churches. What our Adventist evangelists typically called the lock and key argument. Shut them out. The blue ribbon for this form of mistreatment goes to Elder J. M. Rees. When he came to Kennard in February of 1892, he was barred from speaking in the Methodist Church after only two meetings. Then he was banned from the local schoolhouse after only one meeting. Then he was expelled from the Quaker meeting house after seven days, but he was finally permitted to preach in the Episcopalian church for two weeks. As a reward for his persistence, he established a Sabbath school with 14 new members. Far more sinister, of course, was spreading rumors and gossip about Adventists. During H.M. Stewart and M.M. Kenny's series at Knox, four Methodist ministers charged them with being anarchists and said to them, you know, they hang men for that in Chicago. Five other local pastors counseled as to how to stop this Adventist preacher, but they could not agree on the best method. So, well, they debated among themselves Elder Stewart and Kenny reaped six converts and held daily Bible readings and children's meetings three times a week. Now, there were two organizations here in Indiana that opposed the Adventist stand on the Seventh-day Sabbath, as well as their religious liberty efforts. And those two organizations were the American Sabbath Union and the National Reform Association. Both of these groups aggressively supported a national Sunday law. It would seem from the evidence shown in the Review and Herald, therefore, <clears throat> that both groups tended to be stronger in the larger cities, for example, Indianapolis here. For example, Wilbur F. Crafts, he was the field secretary for the American Sabbath Union, delivered a scathing attack on Adventists in Indianapolis in December of 1889, calling their religious liberty journal, which was the American Sentinel, the Adventist Sentinel, and laboring Adventists, <clears throat> labeling Adventists as apostate Americans for keeping Saturday instead of Sunday. Two other groups whom Adventist evangelists had often encountered in early decades, the Mormons and the spiritualists, seldom opposed them in the 1890s. Only once, in May of 1890, did J.M. Rees face opposition from a Mormon when Elder Short of Illinois arrived in Aura, promising to demolish the Adventists on the Sabbath and the State of the Dead issues. So, following a short debate, three listeners converted to Seventh-day Adventism. I never have seen such a complete victory for the truth, Elder Rees wrote. Even its enemies acknowledge their defeat. Likewise, in September of 1892, William Scott began selling the book Great Controversy in Andrews, a center of spiritualism, as we have seen. Its 12 spiritualistic mediums sponsored nightly seances. And that, Scott admitted, has almost broken up the Methodist Episcopal Church here in town. Other congregations, he said, were much perplexed. 
Nonplussed, Scott simply continued visiting in homes, selling Ellen White's book, Great Controversy, to many of the residents. Well, ecclesiastical opposition was definitely on the wane here in Indiana in the 1890s. Physical violence seemed to be growing more prominent. In 1890, local arsonists burned the Maxwell Adventist Church to the ground. But since it was well insured, the members rebuilt it and dedicated it on March 23 of that year. Here they worshiped for 12 years until in 1902 they purchased the local Quaker chapel. In 1892, some rascals in Terre Haute, thinking that J.M. Rees and W.A. Young represented the Salvation Army, which was equally as unpopular as the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, threw stones at their tent and heckled them for several evenings in June of 1892. When P.G. Stanley, S.S. Davis, and R. H. Sparks preached on Romanism, and the United States of America. Down in Indianapolis in June of 94, hecklers shouted back at them that Catholics and Protestants would soon be uniting, and then Rome would be the ruling mistress of the world. The trio received death threats and notes ordering them to leave town within two days. Instead, the American Protective Association of Indianapolis sent armed guards to watch over their tent and to watch over them while they slept at night. As a result, eight listeners signed the covenant and 45 converts formed a Sabbath school. Days later, H.M. Stewart, R.M. Harriman, and W.C. McQuarg, preaching on the papacy in Bible prophecy, so riled up the Catholics in Buffalo that some men threw stones at their tent five different times and then threatened to burn it down. Despite such threats, 14 attendees signed the covenant and three ministers organized a Sabbath school of 18 members there. Occasionally, individuals received anonymous death threats. Put yourself in the foot prince of this family in Kokomo. For months during 1896, Dr. W.H. Ebert and his family there in Kokomo received unsigned notes under their front door threatening their granddaughter. And then their well was poisoned. And then their cattle were all killed. And then their barn was burned to the ground. How would you react? The Eberts decided to arm themselves with guns while kind neighbors formed a watch committee to guard their property. Following months of such threats and subsequent vigilance, their anonymous enemies ceased harassing them and this much persecuted Adventist family could finally live in peace. Illness and disease occasionally thwarted Adventist evangelist efforts as well. In the spring of 1891, J.M. Rees battled a serious case of hoarseness at Farmersburg, and yet he managed to complete his lectures. He reclaimed one backslider, baptized another convert. A year later, H.M. Stewart was put out of commission by a life-threatening case of malaria, and that was extremely common in Indiana and Michigan, too. There were so many swamps with mosquitoes which caused the malaria, a common affliction. Another frequent scourge was called la grippe. It's a colloquial term used to describe influenza. Victor Thompson succumbed to it in February of 1894, but continued his meetings in Marion until eight converts joined the church, making 34 members altogether. Although John Covert described his illness as a bad cold in February of 94, he too may have had influenza. At any rate, when the winter temperatures plunged 70 degrees in only a few days at Noblesville, Elder Covert added laconically, 
I thought it best to defer the baptisms of several converts for another day. 70 degrees drop. Yet even more pernicious than physical illness and death were the spiritual battles waging within some congregations during the 1890s. Victor and Lucerne Thompson were shocked by the coldness and indifference they encountered in the Hartford City Adventist Church in the summer of 1890. Focusing their sermons on the precious message of righteousness by faith, these two brothers presented the beauties of the gospel of Christ until a spirit of earnestness came into their listeners' hearts and two individuals were baptized. J.M. Reeves faced the same problem later that winter at Farmersburg where several youth and elderly members had apostatized and others seemed discouraged. After Reeves presented the message of righteousness by faith, many confessed their coldness and indifference and sought the Lord anew, he exclaimed, and with weeping confessed their way back to the light. Two were baptized, one was rebaptized. In the spring of 1891, Victor Thompson regretted reporting that the church at Homer had been greatly reduced by apostasies and removals. To avoid the same result in Akron, Elder Frank Starr had to exercise some church discipline, as he phrased it, to help certain members see their wrongs and repent. During a week of prayer at Terre Haute, only days after his wife had died, David Oberholzer, a rather stern-looking German, battled a spirit of insubordination and independence permeating the Terre Haute Church due to what he called lax discipline. Sensing that the congregation was on the border of anarchy, that's his phrase, Elder Oberholzer expelled two church officers and had eight new ones elected. We left them all feeling of good courage in the Lord, he added, thankful that anarchy had been avoided. But probably the most serious internal threat to the Indiana Conference occurred quite late in the decade. It was called the cleansing message by its advocates. It was called the Holy Flesh Movement by its opponents. And it disrupted the spiritual harmony and unity beginning in 1898 and extending into 1901. This phenomenon, however, did not originate in Indiana, but in Battle Creek where Alonzo Trevier Jones and William Warren Prescott between 1892 and 94 preached that the Holy Spirit was about to descend in a latter rain that would produce the loud cry of the third angel, Revelation 14, verse 9. They also promoted miraculous healings as a manifestation of the Spirit's work. Now, when controversy arose over the claims of a woman named Anna Rice to prophetic inspiration, it brought this movement to an end in 1894. Others, however, took up the torch. In 1897, a man named Albion Fox Ballinger, a young Adventist minister, initiated a revival at the Pennsylvania camp meeting and later in Battle Creek with his famous message, Receive Ye the Holy Ghost. Between 1897 and 99, Elder Ballinger traveled around the country, preaching that after receiving forgiveness of past sins, a Christian must then move on to a second stage, which he called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which brought victory over all sin and salvation from all sickness. Consequently, faith healings became a regular part of his revival meetings. Between 1898 and 1900, R.S. Donnell and Sidney Davis, the first was the Indiana Conference president, Donnell, the second, Davis, was the leading evangelist in the conference. They radically repackaged these holiness themes, preached by A.F. Ballinger, A.T. Jones, and Sarepta Miranda Irish Henry, whom we met this morning. 
In his 96-page book, The Two Adams and Their Relation to the Two Covenants, Elder Davis taught that true conversion replaced corruptible earthly flesh with incorruptible translation flesh. He said that was the same experience that Christ had passed through in the Garden of Gethsemane. Those Adventists who went through this experience were born sons and daughters of God. With Christ dwelling within them, they could no longer sin, for they had reached sinless perfection. Likewise, in his 10-page manuscript entitled The Nature of Christ and Man, Davis taught that God's purpose was to make human beings into miniature gods, to fill them with the indwelling Christ and to make them members of the Godhead who not only could not sin, but who would not even be tempted to sin. Davis, who had been ordained to the gospel ministry in 1895, had established the Helping Hand Mission in Evansville that I mentioned a moment ago in August of 1898. And this is downtown Evansville as it used to look. Reporting in the August 23, 1898 Review and Herald, he described his revival meetings at the First Baptist Church in Evansville that summer. We have reached the time of the message, Receive ye the Holy Ghost, and we are actually having Pentecostal times and apostolic experiences. The message is rising and grand and awful times are upon us. What was described in the review as a continual revival service actually lasted for three straight months, resulted in the organization of a church of 18 members on November 27 in Evansville. When Elder R.S. Donnell was elected president of the Indiana Conference at the August 1899 camp meeting in Alexandria, A.J. Breed declared he has the confidence of all the people. Donnell appointed Sidney Davis Indiana Conference revivalist in December of 1899. Subsequently, Donnell and Davis took their highly emotional preaching style out to the churches around the state. When Sidney and his lovely wife, Elnora, visited Evansville, Elnora, Salem, Linton, Farmersburg, Terre Haute, and Bogstown in the spring of 1900, they encountered what they described as most Adventists being in a cold, backslidden condition. In many places, divided and scattered and torn by the enemy. So Davis's fiery sermons on the Laodicean message transformed these cold Christians into repenting saints. In all these places, shouts of victory made the churches ring, he wrote, rejoicing to see 67 converts added to the church rolls. These highly emotional revival meetings clearly reflected the Salvation Army's approach to vigorous preaching and march time music. All of this came to a head, of course, in 1900 at the summer camp meeting held at, at uh, Lafayette, uh, at Sullivan, at Vincennes, and at Muncie. All right, that's downtown Muncie, as she was in the 1890s. Hearing disturbing reports about bedlam at these camp meeting gatherings, the General Conference sent Elder Stephen and Hetty Haskell to Muncie to report on what they saw. Stunned, the couple, Stephen and Hetty, shown here in this slide, they heard Elder Davis shouting and yelling, and Elder Donnell channeling spiritual power through his outstretched arms toward the congregation. They heard the ear-splitting sound of an organ, two tambourines, a bass drum, a bass viol, two trumpets, two fiddles, and a flute all blasting popular dance tunes to which sacred words had been added. In their letter to Ellen White, Hetty compared the singing to the shrieks of the near insane, claiming that the music was so loud 
no one could understand the words being sung. She further described their services as frenzied, mob-like situations with noise, bedlam, and shrieking. Elder Davis, she said, gave a perfect tirade rather than a sober sermon. One woman, she added, became so distraught that she was taken from the meeting to an insane asylum. Another female present had a nervous breakdown. Still others were rendered unconscious. Hetty concluded her letter by saying, it is distressing to one's soul. When Mrs. White returned from Australia in 1901 to attend the general conference session, she boldly rebuked Donnell and Davis who were in the audience. And she combated the Holy Flesh movement as a dangerous delusion of Satan. Well, humans can have holy hearts in this life, she said. They can never attain holy flesh until glorification occurs at the resurrection day. Only the righteousness of Christ makes us holy and sanctified. Accepting holy flesh teaching, she warned, would lead to the belief that the truly converted could not sin. Hence, everything they did was holy, which would lead to moral anarchy. She had been shown in vision that demons in the form of human beings were present at holy flesh camp meetings and that Satan was working amid the din and confusion of the music. Days later, Donnell and Davis confessed their errors and resigned their positions in the Indiana Conference. Thereafter, the Holy Flesh movement largely died out in Indiana. I hope my plain speaking has not offended anyone, but I have done the research in the primary documents at the Center for Adventist Research at Andrews University. If the Holy Flesh movement for a brief period disrupted the spiritual peace and unity in the conference, the forces of nature frequently did so. Heavy spring rains disrupted the meetings of J.M. Rees at Bogstown, F.M. Roberts at Pleasant Mills and Mount Olive, and the Thompson brothers at Lebanon in 1890. Summer showers caused havoc for J.M. Rees and W.A. Young's tent meetings at Frankfurt and for S.G. Huntington, David Oberholzer, and Brother Hansen's gatherings at Terre Haute in 1893. Gully washers in October of 93 washed out M.M. Kenny and R.M. Harrison's tent meetings at Clay City, forcing them to take refuge in a rented hall. Bitter winter blizzards and blowing snow rendered it impossible for F.M. Roberts and John Covert to continue their series at Petersburg in February of 95. So they resorted to visiting interested individuals in their homes instead. Roads blocked by drifting snow could sometimes be traversed by horse-drawn sleighs and cutters, but roads knee-deep in mud prevented all modes of transportation from getting through. M.G. Huffman faced both high water and muddy roads when he preached at Dover Hill in the spring of 1890. Victor Thompson slogged through rain and mud to hold services at Napanee, February of 1891. David Oberholzer learned just how tough Hoosiers could be, though, in the summer of 1894, when torrential rains at Jonesboro turned the roads into quagmires so deep in mud, no horse-drawn buggies or wagons could possibly get through. Instead, the people who attended his meetings walked nine miles across the soaked fields to attend his meetings. Nine miles, muddy fields, how determined they were. Despite the challenges Adventist evangelists faced due to religious opponents, ruffians, dissidents within, bad weather without, the record shows that during the 1890s, they established at least 26 new churches and companies across the Indiana Conference, and it's possible there were others we do not know about because they were listed in the Indiana Reporter, which is no longer extant for the 1890s anyway, rather than in the Review and Herald. So here's the list, and it's a good long one. 
The Aura Company and the Glenwood Church joined the conference in 1890, followed by the churches at Morocco, Dana, and Fredericksburg in 91, the year in which the Kiwana Adventist Church was renamed Grass Lake. In 92, the Lebanon and Terre Haute churches joined the conference, and the church at Duggar was renamed the Salem Adventist Church. During 1893, Adventist churches at Kennard, Jefferson, and Knox were organized. The congregations at Frankton and Lytton were voted into the Fellowship of Churches in 1894, followed by those at Elnora and Quinton in 95. The conference formed a company at Walkerton and a church at Etna Green in 96. Churches at Reynolds, Middletown, Fort Wayne, and Tell City gathered in 97. Another church at Anderson in 98. Like many other small groups, the 22 members of the Fort Wayne Adventist Congregation, organized by Conference President William Covert and Elder W.C. White in October of 97, met, first of all, in private homes. Sister Stradley's home at 230 West Creighton Avenue, and then in the Church of the Covenant, and then in rented halls, as in Vodermark Hall above the drugstore at 540 Calhoun Street. This is fairly typical of church development. Their fellowship was so sweet that when Elder J.W. Watt visited them, they gathered for three Sabbath services as well as two Sunday services. Meanwhile, Elder R.H. Sparks and his wife organized the tiny band at Connersville into a company in September of 1899. And that same year, Elder Roberts organized a church at Michaelsville. And one year later, Conference President Donnell, Secretary A.L. Chu, organized the Connersville 19 members into a church. First a company, then a church. In June of 1900, Conference President Donnell organized the South Bend Adventist Church with 18 charter members. A month later, Elder Bigelow baptized three more members in the St. Joseph River. They held their first communion service one week later. The Muncie Adventist Church and two other churches whose names were not mentioned in the review were organized in 1900. So as previously mentioned, in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s, Adventists called their churches meeting houses. But in the 1880s and 90s, they began referring to them as houses of worship. Not until well into the 20th century would Adventist ministers and members feel comfortable using that word church. During the 1890s, Hoosier Adventists erected at least 18 new houses of worship. And there's the good list. In March of 1890, Adventists in Kokomo built what the Daily Gazette described as a very neat little church building at 914 West Taylor Street complete with two wood stoves and several oil lamps. Believers in Maxwell erected their chapel in April, but five months later, as I mentioned, unknown arsonists burned it to the ground. Undeterred, the Adventists in Maxwell built a far larger one that fall and dedicated it debt-free in December. Members at Grass Creek, who also began building their church that fall, attended the dedication on February 8, 1891, the same day that the believers in Glenwood dedicated their new house of worship. Nine months later, the members over in Duggar, renamed Salem, dedicated their meeting house free of debt on November 1. During 1892, the congregation at Dana began laying plans for building a church later that winter. Well, down in Terre Haute, Adventists were hastily applying plaster to the walls of their new edifice on the corner of 12th Street and 8th Avenue, which was dedicated on January 22, 1893. Meanwhile, over at Lebanon, where believers had been trying for two years to scrape together enough money to finish their church, they finally did so in time for the dedication service in May 1893. That same year, the active saints in Marion faced a conundrum because so many converts had joined their congregation in the last two decades. Their first house of worship was now too small. Should they enlarge the building or should they erect a new and larger 
church? Well, they pondered this problem. Adventists in Kennard began laying the foundation of their new chapel in the fall of 93 and dedicated it in February of 94. One month later, believers in El Nora began laying plans to build their first meeting house. Not to be outdone, the 22 members up in Frankton decided that fall to erect the first Adventist brick church in the conference. On a lot donated by Jonathan Moon, they built a 28 by 41 foot building with a platform at the front and a recessed area in the rear. And that November, saints over in Linton erected a smaller wooden house of worship, 22 by 34 feet, for 20 members thanks to the volunteer contractor and money donated by members in Salem and Farmersburg. They had it plastered and furnished two months later. The tiny band of 10 believers in Quinton erected what J.W. Watt called a neat little house of worship in the winter of 95, just as the members in Etna Green were gathering stone and timber and contacting uh, masons and carpenters to organize their volunteer labors to erect a church 26 by 43 feet in the fall of 96. Meanwhile, over at Manan, the saints had raised half the money they needed for their new house of worship that summer. The tiny band of 14 believers in Reynolds also erected a small meeting place in the winter of 1896 and 7, which was almost paid for. On November 28, 1897, Isaac D. Van Horn led the 23 Adventists in Middletown in dedicating what W.B. White called a very pleasant house of worship for 24 members, 21 of whom had come from Mechanicsburg. Six months later, the members of the Evansville Adventist Church built a city mission in downtown Evansville in May of 98 and called for workers to staff it. The congregation over in Connersville built a new chapel on the corner of 13th and Indiana Avenue on a lot purchased by the widow Anna Kessler for $400. She turned around and resold it to the Adventist for $1. Why? She said, because of the love and affection I have for this church. Elder R.H. Sparks served as pastor and his wife, who held a missionary license, as the assistant pastor of the Connersville Church. And that building is still standing today. And we will be visiting it if enough of you sign the tour uh, <laughs> list that is on our list of early Adventist churches in Indiana to visit. So we will stop at this point and invite you back tomorrow morning. I have some new primary source material on the table, which you are welcome to look at uh, as our meeting closes. So let's pause for prayer. Loving Lord, in this portion of our story, we have talked about some triumphs, but also some tragedies. When we, as Christians, allow our emotions to get the best of us, Satan can too often step in and manipulate us. This is what we see in the Holy Flesh movement, emotionalism, excitement, the thrill. Keep us balanced, Lord. Keep us on an even keel. May we keep our eyes on Jesus that we will, like most of the early pioneers, be faithful witnesses and not go off the deep end one way or the other. And so we look forward to that great day of your return and you take us to heaven at last. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.